Hello, everyone. Welcome to Page to Screen, the podcast where we discuss books adapted into films and their movie counterparts. My name is Christina, and with me, as always, is the the gorgeous Nikki. Nikki, how are you doing today? Thank you. I, apparently, I'm feeling gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, today we have a very exciting subject matter. Mm, yes. It, it is a biggie. We've got American Psycho. How do you describe I know. such a book? Yeah, what's the plot? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess I could start with, uh, with, with that. What's the plot? <laughs> oh, yeah. The plot of the book and the plot of the movie, it's weird. I think they're both the same but slightly different. And yeah. I don't know if you have the same feelings about that, but it's mm-hmm. uh, the story is told basically in an unreliable narrative sort of way about Patrick Bateman, who is a investment banker. He does <laughs> murders and executions. Um, <laughs> uh, and I mean, you never in the movie and in the book, they never talk about him actually working. So but he's They're never also working. They're never working, which no. is one of my favorite parts. Yeah. He's also like a part-time serial killer. I mean, the movie plot is basically the same thing. Uh, It's just a little lighter on some of the subject matter from the book. It's it's quite a bit lighter um, than some of the gore fest that you get in the book. And the book also is very much a book experience, the way that he just talks. Yeah. Uh, I, I think they do it differently in the movie with the narration, but the book, it's just talking for, for a lot of the chapters. Yes. Mm-hmm. Did you did you see the movie first or did you read the book first? I saw the movie first and Same. then I read the book later. Same. Mm-hmm. I I am I am glad I saw the movie first. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if I had done it the other way around, I might not have been as interested in reading the book. <laughs> um, I I watched the movie and really loved it. Then a few years later, I was in a book club and read the book as part of the book club. And I actually liked the book a lot more than the movie. And I've, I've had this kind of uh, roller coaster with American Psycho because when I rewatched it this time around for this podcast, I loved the movie so much more <laughs> than what I recalled in the past. So I, I almost feel like I owe the movie a little bit of an apology because I did kind of shit talk it when I read the book the first time. Um, but now I see the movie in a completely different way. We can kind of go into more detail on that later. Um, but I love the two together and on their own. See, I never slept on the movie. Okay. The movie's great. Yeah. The movie's great. And it's not just because Christian Bale is in it. And anyone who listened to us talk about Little Women knows that I like Christian Bale. (laughs) I – okay, let's – the book itself. Let's go back to the the book. Yep. Um, It is, you know, an unreliable narrative. But the book and the movie are basically the same exact thing to the point where almost all of the dialogue from the movie came directly from the book. Which I love. I love. Oh, same. It makes it, it feels more cohesive. Like Yes. It, so on the same level where it's like you, you can't really judge the two together, but you can still like get those parallels. Um, it's, it's like, I'm trying to, to describe like what the book really boils down to. Same with the movie. It's almost like, it's like all the bad stuff from Party Monster. Yeah. All that excess, all of that, like, needing to have the best of the best. Because that is what, what the movie gets really well is that it cuts out all of that excess stuff. Because in the book, there are, the book will have these chapters where he's just, like, out to dinner. And he is describing every single person around him, but he's getting them all wrong, which is a theme that, you know, goes into the movie. But it's like, oh, and he's wearing, you know, an Armani suit with a Perry Mason tie or Perry Mason's that crime guy. I don't think he (laughs) (laughs) does. 
<laughs> but I hear that series is really good on HBO Max. Um, I know. He- I've been wanting to watch it. And it's got, uh, what to say, it's the guy from The Americans, yeah. who I, I really like him. So uh, we've been talking about watching Perry Mason. <laughs> I, I, I look at, I'm also looking forward to his uh, fall uh, collection. <laughs> yes, the Perry Mason fall collection. Yeah. Lots of trench coats. <laughs> trench coats uh, no, but yeah, he... It's going into this shallow world, and it, mm-hmm. it's a statement on it and how they're made to sound like this kind of living is better than everybody else, and yet nobody's happy. Yeah. It's the – it's this idea that material gain will bring you – like material gain and all this like uh, superficialness will bring you to a better point because that's what the 80s were all about. Mm-hmm. Really, the '80s were just what Instagram is now. Right. Like show, <laughs> right. Show your best self to everybody, and nothing can get in your way. And that's basically what Patrick is describing in the book. Like, there's even a part where uh, he he acts. He says this line where it's basically convincing everyone that people, everything's a commodity, even people. Where he. He says, um, because I wrote this down, though it does sporadically penetrate how unacceptable some of what I'm doing actually is, I just remind myself that that this thing, this girl, this meat is nothing. Yeah. And you read that and you're like, oh, thanks. (laughs) Thanks. That's another reason why the book is so hard to read. Yeah. Like the misogynistic I don't even want to call them undertones it is overtones it is the entire tone of the book is just this women are seen as definitely less than to the point where there's so much rape and mutilation and like just the part the part with his ex-girlfriend right where he like tortures her for days yeah like I have I can safely say especially with this reading for the podcast. I have read this book three times, cover to cover, and every time I have nightmares. Yeah. It's like, you know, both both you and I are into true crime stuff. Yeah. Uh, With true crime, I can read quite a lot with, uh, you know, the gore of things, and it doesn't really get to me. And um, it... There's just so much of it, and the details are done in the right way where it, it does kind of make your stomach kind of turn over. Yeah. Uh, it, it is hard to read, um, especially because it puts you in that really bad place where you are him. You are the one doing those things. And when your mind starts to work like that, it's a, a dark place to uh, live in. Yeah, I think that is, I think that's a big difference, not just between the book and the movie, but also like, between true crime books and American Psycho. True crime books aren't written by the killers themselves. Where I'm not hearing, you know, like, Golden State Killer or the Night Stalker tell me, like, exactly how they did it and why. Yeah. But with Patrick Bateman, you... He's leading us through the story. We have nowhere else to go. We're kind of stuck. It's like being a ghost and having to haunt, like, a really bad person for the rest of your life. (laughs) You're like, yeah. I really wish you would stop. And he's just like, mm, sorry, not gonna. And you're like, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not even going to touch on the worst of them because it still, like, there are two really bad ones in the book that the everyone really, yeah, the rat and the, the boy at the zoo. Yeah. And we're not going to talk about those because they make me it's, sad. It's like the Kansas City Butcher, like... <laughs> Like, his dream, his dream short stories are those, yeah. those sections. Ooh, but I did find a fun fact, going back to true crime. Do you know that the the Ken and Barbie killers from Canada? Yes. Uh, yeah, Paul Bernardo and uh, Carla Homolka. I can never say her name right. Well, apparently, when I was doing research on the book, because um, it was only available paperback everywhere, and it's actually banned in a lot of places, or you have to buy it wrapped in a brown paper bag. You have to be 18 or older to buy it. Like, it's a whole thing in other countries. America, buy the book. Go read it. It's fine. (laughs) Um, What's a brown paper bag going to (laughs) do? It's a secret book. (laughs) The Toronto Sun reported that Paul Bernardo 
actually owned a copy of American Psycho. Uh, and it was on his bedside table. And he they're, they're quoted as saying that he read it as his Bible. Though later on it turned out it actually belonged to his wife, Carla. And it's unlikely that Bernardo ever read the book. But the thing that I find so crazy about that is like, Carla basically told everybody that Oh, you know what? I'm not going to go into the Ken and Barbie killers. You guys should listen to a couple of different podcasts and read about it. But knowing that they had American Psycho, a story where a man kills all these people and then no one believes him, it's very, it's very interesting. It was a very interesting true crime moment for me, and I got very excited about it. Wow, yeah, that's actually really crazy. I didn't know that. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was... Like, that was my big. That was my big fun fact for this episode. I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the that's where the murders in the book they're they're gruesome and grotesque, and they're drawn out. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, the next chapter is like, "You like Huey Lewis in the news?" <laughs> and it is 12 pages on sports or like, you know, any Huey Lewis in the news album, song, anything. That is like, y'all ever heard of Phil Collins? And then there's a whole <laughs> chapter. I think this comes right after The Little Boy, which is why it's seared in my mind and so problematic for me. The chapter about Whitney Houston. Yes. And it's just like, I'm sorry, do you not re- remember what just happened literally two sentences ago? Now you want me I, to hear about the greatest love of all? I can't <laughs> do this right now. I I love that though because it's it is a roller coaster where you have this darkness then you get to cool off the next yeah. chapter and it, it's almost like as a reader you're reading it and kind of shaking oh, and yeah. just kind of taking a breather for a moment before jumping back in it's and the weirdest thing about it too is that there's no warning to any of it like mm-hmm. one minute he's you know telling you what everybody's wearing at a bar and the next he's you know talking to his mom then there's a murder then it's all Whitney Houston then it's and it jumps around so much that by the time you get to the end of the book you're just as lost as everybody else because everybody Mm -hmm. when you get to the end everyone sounds the same Mm -hmm. and I mean that's basically the point there is this whole thing where in the film Patrick says um because he's with Evelyn in the car. Oh, Evelyn. He, <laughs> he says he wants to fit in. Like, that's why he wears what he wears. That's why he does what he does. He wants to fit in. But he wants to fit in in a world where everyone just wants to be the same. Yeah, they're all just uh, like Stepford wives. Yeah. Wives versions of each other. Except it's men. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like the way that everything's presented in the book where you do start to feel like you're losing it. This book does something that is one of the coolest things I had, had ever experienced up until the point when I read it the first time. And that's, uh, I don't know if we have the same pages, but it's page 141. And it's in, it's the lunch uh, chapter and the chapter ends in the middle of a sentence. It's oh, and. Yeah. He's so smart the way he did it because it's not only in the middle of a sentence, but it's in the middle of a quotation. So you know that it's not just a printing error. I, I'm one of those nerds where when I'm reading, I'll, I'll catch like a, a comma that's missing or a misspelled <laughs> word. Um, and I remember the first time I thought, wait, wait a minute, what? And, you know, looked to the next page and then went back. And just the realization that that is the way it is and that it's just him completely losing track of time. It's just so brilliant. Yeah, it was, it, it's unnerving because you're like, wait, what, what just, are you not going to finish that whole thing? <laughs> you question your own sanity. Yeah, and then the next scene, they're like, don't they go to like the U2 concert right oh, after that? Me. I think so. Yep. <laughs> wow, you're good. You're pretty good. <laughs> I've read it three times. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that sort of thing where you're just like, you don't know what's going to happen, so anything can happen. Mm-hmm. And it's just so mind-boggling. Yeah. 
But I think that the the craziness of it and that unreliable narrative and the stopping and starting really helps when we get to the movie version. Yes. Um, and this, the movie is really interesting because I know I know that there's a lot of people who, I know a lot of people who have read the book and then we're like, I'm not going to watch that movie. Or Why? people who have read the title and don't want to watch the movie. Because I think everyone seems to think it's just like, like super slasher, like stabby, stab, stab, stab. It's really not. It's yeah. really not. Especially because like the cover photo is Christian Bale and he's got a big knife. And it's, it's less, the movie is definitely less about the murder and more about the satire of, you know, the 80s itself. Yeah, and, and I, I it's sad that that gets lost on people. I am not someone, I don't want to watch a movie that doesn't have some sort of style behind it or a good story, and it's just a gore fest. I'm not yeah. necessarily into that. Um, it, and it's like this, mo- this movie and book is similar to A Clockwork Orange, where, yes, is there a crazy amount of violence, but also there's a point to it. There's yeah. a... A message behind the madness. Yeah, it's never just violence for violence' sake. It, there is there is something that you should be taking away from this, but you have to dig a little bit for it. Um, Big question for you, yes. which if you've read it three times, you are the expert <laughs> here. <laughs> the nightmare expert, of yeah. American Psycho. Uh, do you have a strong position on whether or not? all of this happened or it's in his head? It depends on what format you're asking me in. Ooh. Uh, Because Mary Heron does a really good job with the movie, which, spoiler alert, everyone, a woman directed the movie. It's it's great. Watch it. She does a this feminist, really good. A feminist yes. directed the movie. Yeah, and I, I really do think that she brought a lot of feminist overtones to the film, which you don't really get from the book. Nope. Um but at the end of the film, you're left with this ambiguous, maybe none of it did happen. Because no one can really believe it. In the book, I feel, because you're really following him down this rabbit hole of confusion and fear and loss, and he's setting it up himself in the book, where he can't even keep track of who the people are in his life. Right. I feel like in the book there is a possibility that, yeah, he did murder a bunch of these people. And based off of how America was in the 80s, where it was like, you are successful or you are nothing, a lot of the people that he killed, because he he kills a lot of homeless people, he kills a lot of sex workers, like he kills his ex-girlfriend, a lot of that, I feel like, it gets swept under the rug because of his status. Right. So then when you get to the movie, I feel like it's more ambiguous and gives you an opportunity to just be like, maybe he was right at the beginning. Maybe his mask of sanity did slip and he is having these alternate reality fantasies based off of the doodles in his journal. Yeah. And uh, I have always taken the position that it's all true and he gets away with it because of status. Then upon rewatching it and that last bit where, and it's uh, Chloe Sevigny once again, popping up. (laughs) Oh my God. Back to Um, back. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, and she's going through that journal and seeing the the photos and then the same, at the same time he's being told none of it happened. It it is, I felt more like it it is playing into the ambiguity of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I, I like where something's left for the audience to answer. Yeah, because I feel like with the book, every time I read it, I feel like I'm angry at the end. Yeah. And I'm yeah. more – like, I'm angry the whole time, really. I know, Let's get I was real. too. <laughs> but you get to the end of the book and you're like, what? What do you what – you, this is not an exit? Okay, but what? And then with the movie, at least, I can feel – I can feel okay yeah. with the actions that, that occurred in the film because I can, I can justify like, oh, it didn't actually happen. He didn't kill the homeless yeah. guy. He didn't kill, you know, anybody. He didn't, he didn't kill Paul Allen. Like, <laughs> Paul Allen. Paul Allen. <laughs> uh, yeah, and 
uh, with the book and its explanations of all the fashion and watches and the, the wealth of it all, it, it kind of makes me sick to my stomach too. Yeah. I, when I first read it, I was much younger. I think I was maybe 18. Even though I wasn't a materialistic person when I was 18, I wasn't as anti-materialism as I am yeah. now. Um, you know, if Carlos ever bought me a, a diamond watch, I would probably be pretty upset with him about it. Like, just go buy me some some weird books for me and I'll, I'll be good. <laughs> So that's that's all I need yeah. from a, a sugar daddy. I don't I don't like this this excess, um, and even that was pissing me off in the book. <laughs> and, and so you know, between the the treatment of women, the just the type of people that they are, and the excess, it's just kind of sickening. Yeah, it's kind of it's it is very grotesque. And as someone who lives in New York City, I am I see I see, I don't want to call them Batemans. <laughs> but I do see Batemans like, and you can tell it's the guys who it's the middle of summer you're on a stuffy subway here picture it summer 2019 because we can't do it now there'd be men in these very expensive looking suits I don't know how much a suit costs I've never worn one but they'd be in these very expensive looking suits and they'd have to take their jacket off and like their armpits are all sweaty and mine are all sweaty but I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt on my way to work and they're wearing like penny loafers with their big leather duffel bag things and it's like why do you do this to yourself like yeah who do you have to show off to 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 go higher up in your company. And then I'm like, am I not doing enough? Like, <laughs> You know what's funny? Uh, with the whole COVID thing, because uh, where I work, usually it would be business wear, business casual. That's all been lifted. Nobody's seeing each other. So then you end up on the Zoom calls and everybody's wearing just regular everyday kind of clothing. And you're seeing business professionals in tank tops and you know, no makeup. And it's just like, why did we have to do this whole song and dance for all of these years? Because you're no less intelligent on this call than back in February of this year. Yeah. It's just kind of stupid. And I, I appreciate fashion. Both you and I do. I yeah. like fashion. I especially like fashion history. It's a great way to express yourself and to have your own creativity just on you. You become a different person when you're wearing different things. So there's certainly something to that, but, but there's a huge difference between, um, you know, throw a little bit of glitter on your hunchback <laughs> and, you know, feeling good about yourself and a hundred dollars for one pair of underwear. Yeah. There is definitely, there is definitely a difference. Like, especially comparing this to the people in party monster. Like you did, like it is, you have, fashion for art's sake and then you have fashion to fit in and I don't yeah. believe with the fashion to fit in I don't believe in the fast fashion like the Instagrammy, this sort of thing I believe yeah. in dressing in what feels comfortable for you and just being just being able to express yourself through your clothing so that people unlike Patrick Bateman can remember who you are <laughs> <laughs> I just need people to remember they had dinner with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized, too, Party Monster and American Psycho take place uh, in overlapping years in New York. Yes, they do. And Patrick Bateman does go to Tunnel. Yeah. So. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are we going to make, like, uh, an American... American Psycho, Party Monster, MCU, Expanded Universe. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> Ryan oh, Murphy, give us a call. TM, TM, TM. <laughs> um, Okay, I think we can talk about the movie a little bit more. Yeah. It's it's pretty well done. I, I really like it. And this time around, I guess before it didn't hit me quite as much about how much of a comment it's making on feminist ideas. And at this time it struck me quite hard that that's what it's doing. And I don't know how I missed it before. Yeah. I think I, a lot of that, you can tell a lot of it comes from, you know, the way it's directed, mm -hmm. like with Mary directing it and, um, Oh, Mary also helped write it too. I was going to say it's, it's, um, 
a movie that's not only directed by a woman, but it's also written by two women. Yeah. And I think that is where, that's where I would definitely be like, everyone should just watch the movie. Yeah, it really gives this insight into this hyper-masculine, like, world that's just so, I want to say it's so bizarre, but it feels so grounded in reality. There's, there's two things it does that I really love. The first one is the women who end up being his victims have personalities and, and their own yeah. stories. E- even though you're not seeing huge insights into their lives, you see enough to understand who they are as people. Typically, you don't get that. Yeah. You don't get that in the book, I don't think. Oh, no. None of them have, like, I think some of them don't even have names in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Um, with the other thing that I really love is when you think of the idea of the male gaze, one problem I always have in like rape revenge movies where, uh, even if they're trying to give some sort of power back to a woman who's been victimized, that there's still this kind of grotesque male gaze on them as certain things are, are happening to them. I hate that in this movie she actually does a, like a female gaze where when he's doing this stuff, you're looking at Christian Bale, like he's a piece of meat. Yes. yes and <laughs> some of us more than others. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, well, you know, you love Christian Bale. He is such a wonderful actor. He's great in everything. He has such a weird career. Um, I, I don't find him to, he doesn't do much for, for me, but you can, you can't, deny just how crazy in shape and good looking he is in this movie and it's it does this thing to you where you're like oh he's he's still good looking though (laughs) yeah oh yeah the whole time like the main scene yeah is him running down that hallway he's drenched in blood carrying a chainsaw and I'm like "Eh, at least he looks good in sneakers like (laughs) (laughs) And it's such a pull from reality. And what I also love about that scene is that as he's with like the typical stabby, stabby, kill, kill, and even with the book, all of the women were very like, it was always about their bodies. Yeah. But as he's chasing her down that hallway, she's still wearing a nightgown. Right. You don't see her naked like at all as she's running head on towards camera. No. And it like, which is such a departure from like, Wonder Woman, you know, like they changed all the costumes for right for Justice League, and she's got like a really short skirt on now while she walks towards camera. Cool. <laughs> that's always my that's always the my go to when I'm talking about the male gaze <laughs> of the people, and they start to disagree with me. I'm like, hold on, I'll let hold, give me yeah. one second with the internet, let me pull something for you. <laughs> <laughs> that, or you uh, can even do Harley Quinn. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um. I, I also like the idea I, I like I like how they cast the women and that the one that you really follow lo- looks different than the others. The others all look very polished, like they're part of this world. And then yeah. the one sex worker who we focus in on the most, she's kind of got these weird bangs. Yeah. Um, she's still obviously very attractive, but she just looks like she's living in a lower um, you know, income area. She looks like she is struggling more than the other women. And you really connect with her and feel even worse for her because of it. The other women are all still within this bullshit world where it's like, okay, all right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how How is your vacationing in the Hamptons? Yeah. Oh, which is a chapter in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, I totally agree. It's, you really root for her because she does – she gets so close. I know. She gets so close. When, when – all oh, that part when he goes back to her and she says no and starts to walk away, then he puts his hand out with the money and is whistling at her and then she gets back in the car – the whole time you're going, no, no, yeah. don't, don't get in a car. And it's, it, you feel so bad because she needs the money. Yeah. And she knows better. She knows not to get in that car. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, ugh, it is heartbreaking. It I'd is. I'd say that's probably one of the, the movie overall is kind of like a dark 
comedy situation. It is. And then you get to that one scene and you're just like crushed. You're like, get it. <sighs> yeah. And it doesn't even have any murder in it. It has no violence in it. It barely has any dialogue, but just that look on her face. I know. Oh, great actress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I that, that part too points to it possibly all being in his head because there's no way when she's screaming and she's yeah. slapping the doors that nobody hears her. Oh, yeah. Like, I live in an apartment building. If someone's running down the hallway with a chainsaw – <laughs> laughing maniacally you better believe I'm the first person to hear it but then again I guess you probably wouldn't get out of your apartment <laughs> no but I would at least call somebody like yeah yeah you know I'd be peeping out the people be like hey uh, there's a naked <laughs> guy in my hallway like <laughs> no I like the term peeping at the people <laughs> <laughs> I'm peeping at that old people like what's going on out there what y'all doing <laughs> getting spooky um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like the line. It makes me laugh every time. Uh, it's not particularly funny either, but when he goes, Jean, my secretary, who is in love with me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and can we talk? That's, that is something else too. A very strong point is made by Jean, which I think is very subtle. And I don't think a lot of people notice it. When we first get introduced to Jean, Patrick tells her that he hates her outfit, basically, and wants her to dress sexier for the office. Which right. you're like, oh, awful person. But did you notice at the end when she's flipping through his book, she's basically wearing, like, the pantsuit situation? No, like, I don't. She's, I, she's back in her, like, oh. she's not wearing, I don't believe she's wearing a skirt. That is that is interesting. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> Because like, he chills yeah. the, the book. Yeah. I don't like it. Um, I, I will say, because I am obsessed with Christian Bale, um, did you know that every day from, from casting through the end of the film, not only did he speak with a full-on American accent, but he followed Patrick Bateman's morning routine Yep. from start to finish. Could, could you imagine narrating your morning routine and doing it every single day for somebody? <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> I thought of it this morning, and I was like, get up, walk dog, sit on the couch for an hour while I watch Good Morning America, <laughs> drink a large iced coffee, think about breakfast, two hours later, eat breakfast. <laughs> I'm like, my morning routine is so boring. I <laughs> have weird ones. I, I It's really hard for me to, like, Carlos can just jump out of bed and he's awake, I have to just lay in bed for at least 20 minutes and, and just kind of let myself wake up slowly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I have to get up. I'm like, Carlos, I have to get up. Yeah. <laughs> I have to get out of bed because I feel like uh, I feel like my bed's a sunken place. Like, if I don't get out of bed, I'll be in there all day. <laughs> um, Christian Bale is a crazy person. Um, the, what he's done with his body over the years – Next level. It's insane. <laughs> Next level bonkers. I saw the funniest comment that he made where I think he got pulled back for reshoots or something. And he's talking with, I believe it was a cinematographer. And he just, they're, they're standing there silently and he just sighs. And they look at him and he goes, I'm really tired of eating fucking chicken breasts. <laughs> <laughs> That's really all he ate the whole time. Yeah. And I, what's insane is that he doesn't go. It makes sense if he's going from American Psycho to Batman Begins. No. He does American Psycho. Then he does The Machinist. Yeah. Then he does Batman Begins. So he gained, lost, and gained. Like, it's crazy. His body yeah. is going through so much, and I feel so bad for it. I, don't I feel know. bad for him. I feel bad for the bones. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for the bones. <laughs> I feel bad for your – dear Christian Bale, I feel bad for your bones. Please be nicer. <laughs> He's amazing, though. He is the perfect Patrick Bateman. You look at the list of other people that were attached. There's Leonardo DiCaprio. There is Brad Pitt. Yeah. Who, by the way, let me interrupt myself. Brad Pitt was – 
attached with David Cronenberg. While I love the director that did the movie, I really like David Cronenberg. And I kind of wish I could see the David Cronenberg version of American Psycho, but it's okay. I'll, well, I'll stick with this one. Leonardo but, DiCaprio was attached with Oliver Stone. And I hate that idea. And do you know what happened with that? The, the, it was going through. And then um, it was like, it, it was the whole mix up with uh, What's Your Face? Gloria Steinman. Who? Gloria Steinman, yeah. Fun fact that's Christian Bale's stepmom. Yeah. <laughs> for those, it's all connected. For those who don't know, that's Christian Bale's stepmom. Yeah. Which drives me. It's so crazy because she hated the book. She mm-hmm. told Leonardo DiCaprio not to do the movie because. He had literally just finished Titanic. And he was like, all of these little girls are going to be looking to see what you do next. Yeah. And he missed an opportunity. I think Ewan McGregor was supposed to do it too. And again, I, I like Ewan McGregor a lot. He, he just He's so likable. I can't see him as Patrick Bateman. No. The only person I can see as Patrick Bateman is Christian Bale. and I think, He's perfect. I think it also helps that Christian Bale at that time – wasn't as well known as he is now yes so you have this actor who's not super well known and the film is shot very 80s style so you put it in now and you're like how old is this thing i know yeah it's a it's a pretty good period piece it succeeds in in doing that how old are we we're calling (laughs) calling (laughs) these movies period pieces you know what i thought of this um right before we started recording i was talking to jesse and i was like do you know that there are kids today who, because of Batman, are probably watching American Psycho, and they don't understand the line, I need to return some videotapes? Oh, no. <laughs> I feel so old. Uh, that's my favorite line, too. I, yeah. I use that one sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime I have to get out of a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. There's no blockbuster anymore. Uh, there's one big change in this movie that makes total sense. It's one of the smartest changes that I think they made. Instead, the book takes place in 1989. Yeah. They move it back and place it in 1987. The reason is so that in this world, Ronald Reagan's president. Yeah. That is such a huge change and it's so perfect. It's such a good decision to make Ronald Reagan the president. It <laughs> makes sense. It creates a, it cements I think the world that you're in oh yeah definitely it brings it all like full circle yeah <laughs> um I was watching this movie and staring at Justin Thoreau and I'm like what the <laughs> fuck is wrong with him why is he making me so uncomfortable and it took me forever to remember that he doesn't have blue eyes <laughs> And I, I felt so uncomfortable. Like, there's something off about Justin Thoreau. I don't know what it is. And then I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the other thing. We haven't talked about the other people in this movie. It, this has a great cast. Like, Justin Thoreau, for one, who every time I watch the movie, I forget he's in it. Um, Jared Leto. <laughs> wait, hold on, hold on. Can I, can I stop on Justin Thoreau for a second? Absolutely. Okay, so... <laughs> Okay, um, this was <laughs> this is one time I was working on Hot Topic. Justin Thoreau was um, it was when he got together with uh, Jennifer Aniston, and I saw it. And I went, "Oh my gosh, it's she's with Justin Thoreau now." And then my coworker went, "Well, who's him?" And I, the only movie I could remember that he was in <laughs> was Charlie's Angels. Oh no! <laughs> I'm like, he's in um um. <laughs> Um, Charlie's Angels 2, Full Throttle. <laughs> he has, he's, I mean, he's in this, he's in Mulholland Drive, like, he's in all these movies he's that are critically acclaimed. Movies. Why would you pick that one? <laughs> I don't know. It was the only one I could remember. Um, but what's funny is that they were like, oh yeah, he's the bad guy, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're... makes sense. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, so go ahead, the cast. <laughs> Uh, Jared Leto. I forgot his name for a minute. Uh, Jared Leto as Paul Allen. Yep. Um, and Reese Witherspoon. Who is great. She's yeah. great in this. They're um, all good. She is perfect. When they're, when they're at that restaurant and he's trying to break up with her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
can we add legally blonde to this universe too? Because this is something uh, happens to her yeah. legally blonde. <laughs> Um, Willem Dafoe, isn't it? He's so, he is so good in this. He's so good. He's so good. Because I, the, I'm sure you know the trivia for it. When they were filming him, they had him do all of his scenes three different ways. Right, right. One as if he knew that Patrick was a killer. One as if he had no idea what was really going on. And the other one as if he didn't think Patrick could kill anybody. Right. Then they just mesh them all together and you get this weird... All of his scenes, you're just kind of like, do you know what's yeah. going on? You're the detective. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about? Where are you guys he, going? He is such a great actor. I love any time he's in a movie because I know there's going to be some really cool behind-the-scenes stuff with mm-hmm. him. Like, um, there's the thing with uh, Spider-Man where when he was doing the, the scenes where he's playing against himself that he recorded them so that he actually would be acting with himself. Um, there, there's a funny story with uh, uh, The Lighthouse where Robert Pattinson wouldn't stop asking questions about what was going on. And <laughs> Willem Dafoe was just like, eh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm reading the script. Like he, he didn't want to know, didn't need to know. Yeah. He just got it. And like, he, he's one of those actors who in the lighthouse, he gets like three pounds of dirt thrown into his throat. <laughs> I, I think he allows himself to be used in a certain way by directors that a lot of other actors would say no to. Yeah. And I think him and Christian Bale, I think the two of them yes. should be in more movies together. <gasps> oh my gosh. It should have been, um, he should have been Joker. So you're basically <sighs> seeing Batman and Joker talking to each other. That would have been brilliant. Oh my goodness. Um, would you, would you change anybody in the cast? If you Um, could, if you were given a magic casting wand. (laughs) I'm not thinking of anyone to change out. Yeah. I think the movie, I think the movie as a whole stands, stands well on its own feet. I don't think anyone, no one else I think could do it. Like when you think about it, it's just like, no, this is it. Yeah. This is the perfect cast. Yeah, this is one where, because you've seen the the flow of it possibly getting another adaptation. Yeah. Um, I don't really think we need one. Sometimes I, I say that and then I end up enjoying what comes out. But for this one, there's not even like a little curiosity in yeah. me to see, see it done in a different way. And I have seen it done in a different way. <laughs> oh, that's right. You saw the musical. I did see the musical. Jesse took me as a birthday present. Aww. Um, and it was – a lot of people did not like it. I can say that honestly. Uh, it did really well on the West End. Matt Smith played Patrick Bateman, which, which I Which is good casting. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the name of the guy who did it when we saw it, but the way they told the story was – it was truer to the book than it was to the movie. I was going to ask that if it was, if it leaned on more. No, cause there's like, there's a whole musical number about going to see Les Mis, <laughs> which if you remember from the book, that's like the musical of the time. It's on every bus. It's everywhere. I um, forgot that in uh, his apartment in the movie, he's got the Les Mis oh, yeah. poster. Yeah. And I feel like that was a really good callback to something that they weren't going to bring up. Agree. Yeah. Um, his mom and his brother are more apparent in the musical than they are in the movie. Um, Mm -hmm. which is really good but they also cut down some of the violence like they do in the movie so the musical is just and the musical is all the songs basically from the soundtrack so good and I can tell you act one ends with hip to be square (laughs) and the way they did this I I loved it first there was a musical number where he comes to the we we had really good seats Uh, there was a musical (laughs) number where he what's oh Benjamin Walker Benjamin Walker played him. So Benjamin Walker, great job. He comes down through the orchestra seating and he's got these these money guns and he's just like <laughs> shooting money into the audience. What? And I was like, this feels so right. Yeah. And then at the end that of that That sounds long, really fun. That sounds was, really fun. It was brilliant. I don't know why. Also, you could tell that I might have been the only woman who was really interested in being there because there was no line for the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse waited forever to go to the bathroom during intermission. I was in and out. I was like, bye. But the end of Act One, they it is, you know, it's his apartment. They bring down this plastic sheeting and he murders Paul Allen and blood goes everywhere. And it's just like visually. Oh, like it's it, like a, 
Um, wait, do you mean blood goes everywhere, like, into the audience, or? No, like, uh, because they put the plastic sheeting down, it covers most of it, so oh, it's just, like. Oh, I see. Yeah. But the funny thing about it is, because they have to clean it up between Act 1 and Act 2. <laughs> They missed a spot when we saw it. Oh, no. So there was this one big, like, blob of red on the proscenium. And I – something else would be happening. Like, he, there's a part where he leaves Tunnel and all the people are singing um, In the Air by Phil Collins, and it's gorgeous. But I would look up and see that one spot of red, and I'd be like, huh, missed a spot. <laughs> oh, and in the musical, his apartment is – it's reminiscent of the movie, not the book. Okay. Because the book, um, the book apartment, it's very colorful. It's very bright, mm-hmm. and then it gets like kind of dirtier throughout the, throughout the book. His his apartment in the movie is pristine. It is white. Yeah. It's black and white, and sometimes red all over. <laughs> I, hate <laughs> I hate myself. I hate myself. Dork alert. <laughs> Beep boop. <laughs> um, would you recommend the book or the movie? Uh, to select, select folks. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that this book, uh, I, I think most of the people that I know who like to read books, I would recommend it. But it's not necessarily one that um, I think everybody would enjoy. Uh, you know, I know certain people that just, they can't handle the, the deepness of the violence that is in uh, this book. Yeah. If there were an abridged version yeah. <laughs> where they cut out some of that gore, I would definitely be like, everyone should read it. I definitely <laughs> think people should – I've said it like five times already. I think everyone should watch the movie. Yeah. Not just because Christian Bale is a really good actor, but it's a strong cast and it has a great has a great soundtrack. Um, I, I've <laughs> never met anybody that had like the issues that you were talking about you, you know that some people yeah. have had that would annoy me so much I would probably make it my mission to convert them <laughs> to watch it come over for dinner we'll watch a movie <laughs> it's great you guys it's got America in the title come on yeah I, I will say I will say this that I love the movie American Psycho it gives me a lot of the same sort of vibes that A Clockwork Orange does yeah. and takeaways I do think that there is a large amount of people, especially in the horror community, that kind of views Patrick Bateman and what's his face as these like icons. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, hey guys, <laughs> yeah. I get it, but they're bad. They, yeah. <laughs> don't don't lose the point of of the story to to hype somebody in in the wrong way. Oh yeah. If anyone, if I ever ran into somebody who was like. I'm a Patrick Bateman. I'd be like, okay, bye. <laughs> please, please don't say that to me. <laughs> uh, and But I do think that, I think that we're lucky that we still have, that Christian Bale is still doing such crazy films, mm-hmm. like, like Vice. And I mean, you can go all the way back to Newsies, you guys. Uh, because I feel like with him continuing to, I would say he's still on the rise, I guess, because every film he does gets weirder and better. He's like what Robert Pattinson is going to become. Right. He's like <laughs> Christian Bale walks so Robert Pattinson can run. Um, <laughs> I feel – oh, my God, the two of them in a movie together. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take me out now. Um, I feel like because, of, because we have that and because he was so strong as Batman, I feel like this movie is going to continue to resonate – yeah. With younger and younger audiences. And by younger, I mean, like, when I'm 50, 19-year-olds are still going to be watching this. I'm just, I'm just sitting here thinking about Christian Bale and just how good he is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I know everyone seems to think that I'm just, like, madly in love with him because of his body, yaddy, yaddy, but it's not Well, <laughs> I mean, you kind of are, but it's not. <laughs> Jesse, Jesse's giving me a – Jesse's going, oh, yeah, sure. No, it's just <laughs> – I would just suggest that anybody and everybody, like, take a look at his whole filmography. Like, it is, it is insane the leaps and jumps that he has been able to do from child actor. I didn't, I, somehow I missed the craziness between Newsies and American Psycho. That IMDb list turns into a fucking shit show for (laughs) 
quite some time. Check out Swing Kids. That one gets dark. A kid's I've movie with Nazis? What a, he plays a Nazi. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> It's just I I was shocked that he played Jesus. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he plays sexy Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> sexy Jesus. <laughs> that's the only that's the only Christian Bale film I haven't watched. You know Carlos because Carlos has the long hair and he wears uh, <laughs> aviators a lot. Uh, he calls himself Rock and Roll Jesus sometimes. <laughs> and he's got the little facial hair that's kind of similar to. <laughs> I love it. He should be sexy Jesus. <laughs> I'll tell him. Yeah, I'll be like, hey. You and Christian Bale, sexy Jesus. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I had no idea that he played Jesus, and that was a real surprise. <laughs> yeah, he's. Oh, well, he also he also played Moses. <laughs> right. I, I was sitting here thinking, like, was it Noah or Moses? I don't remember. <laughs> he's. If there's a part that could be played, Christian Bale has just been like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, but I'll he go with does it. it so well. Mm-hmm. They're just like he was made for this. Yeah. Thank goodness he did American Psycho and his career got a boost. Yeah. Yeah. Could you imagine who would have been Batman? Like, or no. Sexy Jesus? <laughs> he was a really good Batman. Yeah. See, that was another one where he's got, um, Batman has blue eyes, dark hair. And when he was announced, I was like, oh, that's a little weird because he, He's got. I, I always think of him as having lighter hair, probably because of American Psycho. Yeah. Um, even though he doesn't always. Um, and he's got darker eyes. So I th- went, huh? I don't know about that. But he's so good in it. I was very wrong. <laughs> he's perfect. All right. Big question. Whose business card was actually better? <laughs> um, I by the, I, the business cards <laughs> is such a good scene. Acquisition is spelled incorrectly, and oh, they yes. are all they're, they're all, all the vice president. <laughs> <laughs> they're all so VPs, stupid. and all they do is listen to headphones and do coke and go to restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> I I love that part. I love it, and uh, I do like the the new video that circulated where instead of showing each other business cards, <laughs> they're showing each other phones with cats. <laughs> See, in that one, I agree. Paul Allen had the best cat. He did. <laughs> but I'm going to I'm gonna go out there and say, I don't like Paul Allen's business card. <gasps> I did Scandal. not like it. Every time that scene comes on, I'm like, I hate your business card. And I can't <laughs> – maybe it's because I look at business cards all day. Yeah. Like when I'm at work and I have to find a number, somebody somewhere has given me a business card. Like, just email me. <laughs> and it's – I'm looking at these cards and I'm like, I hate Paul Allen so much. <laughs> Your card is trash. I've always wanted a business card that just says, go fuck yourself. <laughs> so if like I'm out and about and I don't like someone, I go, oh, sorry, let me give you my business card. And then they look down and it just says, go fuck yourself. <laughs> Should I get one too and then we compare? <gasps> yes. Mine's bone. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Uh, well, is there anything else that uh, we haven't talked about yet? No, I think we covered a lot. I mean, I'm sure there are going to be people who will reach out to us on our Instagram or on our Twitter. All that information is going to be in the bio. Yep. You know, so if you think we missed something or if you want to fight me on Paul Allen's business card, which <laughs> sucks, suck it, Paul Allen. Um, <laughs> Go right ahead. I don't care. Paul Allen sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let us know if we missed anything or if you have a favorite line from the book or the movie. But yeah, I think I think we covered all of this Christian Bailiness. Well, what are we doing next? Oh, 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 oh. What is it? Oh, we're doing Dracula. <laughs> Dracula, I want to suck your blood. We don't go around going bleh, bleh. I am so excited to talk about Dracula with you. I know it's one of your favorites, so. Yeah. Oh, yup. Oh, yup. 
<laughs> in a weird mood. Um, okay, well, I we will see each other next time with Dracula. Yeah, so go to the library, use your library cards, get the book, watch the movie, and we'll see you soon. I have to go return some videotapes. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> Bye. Bye.